Hello. Hello, welcome. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm fine. We are all fine, especially for uh, hosting you for the last but not the least session of the series of Batman University Academic Talks. Uh, how are you? How is going? Well, it's very good. Glad uh, to be here. Uh, hello, Yusuf, as well. Uh, hello, uh, my dear friend. How are you? I am very good. I'm very good. Very uh, pleasure to see you. Uh, thank you very much. You accepted us. And, uh, you know, uh, every week uh, our International Relations Office organized uh, Erasmus Academic Talks. We 
uh, especially uh, from European countries, from Middle East uh, countries, many, many academics participate us and uh, today, uh, this night you accept us and we will talk Israel, uh, very important issues, very important topics. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you uh, and also our uh, Erasmus uh, International Relations Office team, uh, Emra Hışık, uh, professor, thank you very much. And also uh, our uh, dear uh, uh, team uh, members uh, also participate. And uh, this week, uh, the last one uh, uh, we conducting. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, everyone. Uh, I, I want to uh, especially share my uh, opinions because uh, every week uh, we talk about international uh, subjects, topics, and um, many academics and our students, our uh, academics participate as uh, very important for Batman, Batman University. Again, welcome to our program. And uh, inshallah, today, uh, this night will, uh, very good, will be a very good program for us. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, the Professor Yusuf Chinar, the head of uh, the Office of International Relations. Uh, doc Dr. Bombs, uh, thank you very much again for accepting our invitation for the last uh, session of the series. Uh, dear participants and dear my 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 dear students. Uh, and uh, my colleagues who are uh, participating for this session as well. Uh, before uh, giving the uh, the talk, the the shift to to our uh, dear speaker, I would like to introduce Doctor Doctor Nir Bombs to to our uh, guests. Uh, Dr. Nir Bombs is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at uh, Tel Aviv University at the International Center for Counterterrorism in Herzliya. Hurt, Hurt, He's a member of the board of the Israeli Council of Foreign Relations and the Institute for Monitoring Peace and Cultural Tolerance in Schools and the co-founder of Cyber Dissidents in ORG a network for, of bloggers from the uh, Middle, uh, Middle East that focuses on the freedom of expression and the promotion of dialogue in the region. In 2012, he co-founded the Teol Rehla uh, project uh, by nas national and educational, educational initiative, bringing Israelis and Palestinians together to travel and learn the history and the identity of each other. Prior to his return to Israel in 2004, he served as the vice president of the Washington-based Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, FTD. Uh, uh, dear Dr. Uh, Nir Bombs, this stage is your, yours. We, we are really pleased to uh, have you again today, today. Thank you very much. Many uh, thank, uh, thanks, uh, Imra, and I. Am, uh, it's a good and a pleasure to see all of you. I hope that I'll be able to see some more of you. Uh, uh, it's always a challenge in the Zoom um, mode, so I hope I'll be able to see some uh, some more of you uh, if you're able to put your cameras on. Or uh, um, and I hope that we'll also have uh, really a, a, a discussion here. Um, it's actually interesting to speak about Israeli uh, politics. Uh, just days uh, following, uh, uh, I think, very important days uh, in Turkey. Uh, as somebody who's been following regional politics and a little bit of Turkish politics, and somebody who shares many friends, who have many friends in Turkey, I know that this has been very interesting to say the least. And I think it's also relevant to to start uh, there because if you really want to have a degree of understanding. Uh, or a zoom out understanding of some of what is happening in uh, Israel, um, then I think uh, the, some of the dynamics in your country may serve as, at least as an analogy uh, to uh, some of the dynamics that we're seeing here. 
And this is perhaps one way of saying before we delve into the Israeli realities that uh, uh, the world uh, today and the world of politics today, uh, and there are a number of factors contributed to it, uh, some models have changed. Um, this is still, broadly speaking, the post-COVID era uh, where scholars are analyzing the, the influence um, uh, of social media uh, that has been growing in its influence and, broadly speaking, contributing to polarizing uh, dynamics uh, all across uh, the globe in many ways. I mean, if you're looking at democracies and if you're looking at some of the um, data that comes uh, from some of the institutions that uh, follow uh, democratic tendencies, and you will see that uh, we're looking at the third wave in decline uh, and data about uh, growing polarization uh, in many places, uh, in Europe, in the United States, um, in the Middle East, the, the term democracy does not apply to uh, so many places. Um, and again, perhaps uh, when we get to the discussion, I'll be curious to see if, if any of this uh, sound familiar to you. Uh, when you observe uh, some of the dynamics uh, in, in, in this context in, uh, uh, in Turkey. Um, the title that I was asked to, to comment on is The Rise of uh, Radical Right and the Future of Relations with the USA um, in, um, in the context, of course, of Israeli uh, politics. And uh, being Israeli who is engaged in public uh, discourse, you know, we're often used to the fact that uh, there is a magnifying glass sometimes above our head. Uh, Israel tends to uh, be on the headlines uh, regarding uh, various issues of uh, policies. Um, and in the last uh, five years, uh, for those who have been following uh, Israeli uh, politics, well, they had a lot of work. Uh, it was very difficult to discern uh, which government is actually in control. I was in the parliament, uh, our Knesset, uh, not so long ago with a group. And uh, you, there is a custom um, to have a, a very nice picture for every government. Uh, and you, 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 you put it in a nice place in the corridors. Um, they begin to have a, an interesting uh, crisis. Um, because when you have a, a government that is being replaced every six months or so, uh, it sometimes you're not able to even prepare all the pictures and understand who the minister is, and then you need to already frame it and put it on the wall, and then you're running out of wall space, and you actually see like a very nice picture of a government that has been uh, the in information for uh, uh, for six months, and, and a minister that has been the information for three months, and that uh, creates a very difficult political uh, environment, uh, not just in the political sense, you have a political debate that is much broader than the political structure, but really just in terms of the functionability of government structures. Um, and with all of this, I assume that the headline that was uh, given here, uh, Rise of Radical Right, has to do with uh, the uh, existence uh, of, of this particular uh, government. Uh, that was uh, selected with a solid but narrow uh, majority. Um, we have 120 uh, members of parliament, members of Knesset, uh, uh, representing a historical number has to do with the 12 tribes of, uh, of Israel. Then 64, a little over half, uh, had voted for the coalition uh, of uh, basically the right side of the political map. I'll say a little bit more about this, uh, especially if, if some of our political system is not always clear to uh, to everyone. Um, Israel has a multi-party system. Uh, and, and this means that there are different platforms that run for uh, for office. Uh, it, is, it has been uh, very, uh, since for over 40 years, I think, there has not been one party that was able to actually win uh, a majority. You always need a coalition government uh, in order to have at least 61 votes, which is the minimum number uh, to have uh, the former government. And usually the, la the largest uh, party would have uh, uh, 
around 30 or 30 something seats, sometimes even less than that. And therefore you need some of the other smaller parties in order to form a ruling coalition. Uh, the Israeli polity uh, or, or, or political uh, environment has changed a bit and we've had uh, in, in the last few years, a, a very important factor, uh, uh, which is not just a political factor, but also a personal factor. It has to do with our prime minister, uh, the current prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Benjamin Netanyahu is the longest acting prime minister uh, in the history of the uh, state. He had surpassed uh, David Ben-Gurion, um, who was the founding uh, father of the state in many ways and the first uh, prime minister. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has been there uh, since the late uh, 90s uh, with some breaks and he was able to eventually form a government uh, really in foreign, following four cycles of elections uh, that uh, really resulted uh, in a almost a status quo and lack of ability to form a government um, or a government that lasted a very short time. Uh, and then in the last round, following uh, a very fierce uh, uh, campaign uh, uh, and a, 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 a very uh, a tricky um, uh, 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 conduct of the different uh, parties, um, the, uh, there was a victory for the uh, bloc led by uh, the Prime Minister. Um, and that bloc included uh, significant uh, gains for uh, some parties that uh, are described, not just right, but uh, in a way, radical uh, rights in, in Israel. And you may have heard about people uh, uh, like uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir or Bezalel Smotrich that are usually uh, the ones who appear on the, on the media around these issues um, uh, because they had received the prominent roles as ministers in this government uh, by uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and that all related to the uh, coalition system, meaning the largest party uh, would not have enough votes to form uh, a government, and therefore it needs the smaller parties, and in other, they are doing coalition agreements um, and they need to be, uh, uh, and they're being given uh, uh, political roles uh, for for that uh, uh, political positions um, uh, in 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 return. I'll zoom out for a second. I'll say something larger on the political uh, orientations in Israel that has changed. Um, in if you're looking at the 75th years of Israeli independence. Israel started as a socialist uh, endeavor. The majority of the politics uh, was uh, hand-controlled uh, by the Labour Party, by the beforehand by the Mapai Party. This, these were the left-leaning parties highly influenced by socialist, socialism, uh, even by communism, uh, Israel, in the first few decades of its existence, have acted very much uh, as a, a socialist state um, until this very day, uh, uh, unlike, let's say, our, our, uh, if you juxtapose it with the American model, until this very day, Israel is, uh, has a deeper structure of government involvement, a bit more similar to Scandinavia, um, and uh, then let's say to uh, to England or or to the United States, uh, national uh, uh, security, very strong uh, workers uh, union, trade unions, uh, very strong organized labor. Uh, we've had something called kibbutzim, uh, really big communes, uh, again socialist types of structures. All of that was very much part and parcel of the political structure. Uh, and that influenced politics uh, until really the year 1979. So between 1948 until 1979, um, Israel was very much dominated by these structures. That includes media. Uh, and that was uh, very much of a left-leaning uh, uh, politics. 
1979, we've had the first, uh, uh, what we call the, uh, 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 the turning point, where the more conservative faction, uh, it was Kherut, or what later became Likud, um, Prime Minister Menachem Begin, uh, and that's where it started. And since then, uh, there were uh, uh, a number of other uh, rounds in, in where there was uh, uh, some uh, 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 divisions between the left and the right, pending on the uh, elections, and then also later on, uh, with uh, prime ministers uh, like uh, Ariel Sharon, who kind of moved a bit from the right into the left, uh, or Prime Minister uh, Ehud Ulmert, um, uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, was parachuted into uh, into his position, and then uh, was became a part of a kind of centrist, new centrist uh, party. Um, and in the last uh, a little over twenty years, it was still shifting back. Uh, into the right with like two short breaks in the middle. Uh, the move, the broad move from Israel being a, a socialist oriented country with its politics into the Israel moving into the right side of the political map uh, has been gradual, but that part has been solid. And it has to do with a few other uh, developments if you're looking at the sociology of Israel. Um, one important part that is very much relevant uh, uh, to uh, to our discussion is the growth of so the more conservative uh, religious population in Israel that had gradually became more politically uh, active. Uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, the demography of Israel, um, and again, that part may also be familiar to you. We have uh, uh, different groups, uh, even if you're looking just at the Jewish voting patterns, not the Palestinians, the Israeli Arabs who constitute about 22% of the uh, uh, population. There's a few other minorities uh, as well. Um, and so... We have uh, uh, that population became uh, uh, more established and in a very gradual process have began to take some of the roles of leadership uh, that used to be uh, kept to other populations. So if like in the 70s, 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, many of the leaders in the military used to be members of kibbutzim, uh, meaning the, the elite of the socialist structure, uh, 80s, 90s, and thereafter, they've taken a, a, a bit of a backseat. Also, the, the whole model began to collapse financially. And you've seen new leadership emerging. And some of that came from the ranks of more religious, um, uh, national uh, groups, who were traditionally moving more to the right. Uh, again, you can add to that, uh, following 1967, Israel uh, is now controlling more and more territories. This has to do, broadly speaking, with the Palestinian uh, debate. Um, some settlements and, and people from that camp are uh, uh, becoming now a second generation. In the 80s and the 90s, they're becoming of age. Many of them take the leadership uh, in, in military positions, in government positions, um, they become more involved and Israel is largely moving into the right. And uh, a related, a very important development here has to do again with demography, is with the, with the ultra-Orthodox. The ultra-Orthodox population in Israel was very small at the beginning of Israel. And the ultra-Orthodox, again, just for just making sure that I'm using some language that is somewhat clear. If you've seen the figures, even in movies, of Jews with uh, black hats and suits and, you know, uh, kind of funny things here on the hair and the big beard, a very typical, stereotypical Jew. Um, a model that came from Poland uh, sort of a few hundred years ago and still exists. 
So that population used to be very small, but they they began to become larger. Uh, they share a very uh, strict uh, and insular perspective on on Judaism. They basically, for the most part, they said, "Look, we want to live and let live. Uh, we don't really have so many other agendas. We just want to live our life and let everybody leave us alone." But uh, in the last uh, twenty years or so, uh, that population have also been going through a politicized process. Meaning, if you're looking at the same population in the political parties, uh, they were equally as comfortable to have coalitions with the right and equally as comfortable to have coalitions with the left. And they basically said, I'm happy to put my vote to any government that will promise me that uh, you know more money for my people and more money for my schools and to uh, that I can take care of the interests of my community. I don't need to create uh, to have a political ideology that is broader than this. I just want to care for my, for myself. But that began to change. Um, and again, I'm I'm happy to tell you why. Uh, if, if you want to be, to expand on this, because I'm trying not to get into too many complex issues in the, this one lecture. Um, but it began to change when uh, they became more politicized. How it was deliberate, and the next generation became more conservative as well, and they began to develop agendas uh, uh, separately than their own community. This was actually a process of integration, but in some ways is positive. Uh, many more of them uh, began to participate in the workforce. Many more of them began to study secular studies. Um, this is a huge issue in Israel, the whole integration issue, particularly of this community. Um, so they began to be more integrated, but because they began to be more integrated, they began to be also politically active. Um, and the last factor that is relevant to uh, uh, the rise of, of radical right is a personal factor, which I've mentioned before, which is Benjamin Netanyahu, our prime minister. Prime Minister Netanyahu is uh, perhaps one of the most, uh, as I mentioned before, is the longest service prime minister, a very talented and a person with a, a, a very significant record of contribution to our country and to our people. And I'm not saying this uh, uh, just for the for the hearsay, I'm uh, I am a critique of the prime minister. I, I don't subscribe to to his uh, uh, leadership, uh, uh, you know, for for a good number of years now. Um, I think uh, that uh, um, uh, he uh, ha has has now uh, is a source of uh, quite a lot of. Uh, uh, tension, uh, you know, in the in, in in the past few years in Israel, uh, but he, uh, by himself, huh? a very he by himself is is a, a very important factor in the way Israeli politics um, is seen, uh, and if you're looking just at the influence of uh, a very long lasting uh, uh, political leader, and again. That may be uh, uh, familiar to uh, those of you who observe uh, Turkey. Um, when somebody is in office for uh, you know over uh, for over twenty years, there are certainly some effects. And if you're looking at uh, the opposition for Netanyahu, which is very interesting, uh, some of the most significant political leaders that emerged as a competition to Netanyahu have been his own disciples. Um, uh, most of them have actually bypassed him from the right, sometimes have tried bypassed him from the left, but the most significant political opposition to Netanyahu today uh, consists of people that con considered Netanyahu at some point as their mentor and their political patron. Uh, Netanyahu, and again, I'm not going to get into all of that, and I'm happy to, in a few minutes I'll end, and I'm happy to answer questions, and I can get into some of these issues, um, was able to uh, create or assist in creating uh, an, an, a climate of uh, that increased polarization in, in Israel. He had uh, uh, found himself in the midst of a number of uh, uh, political and legal affairs, that became very public, um, that uh, became uh, a part of a judicial uh, process. And as a result, he responded to this, uh, protecting his name and his uh, integrity. Um, that has been a big part of uh, uh, the past election cycles. 
that has been a very significant part of a protest movement uh, that emerged in uh, Israel uh, that has been in existence now, uh, not just for this in this the context of this government, but uh, really in the last four years, uh, you have seen many people going up to the streets saying, uh, we have a political position against the prime minister, uh, and we uh, believe that the prime minister is not doing something uh, uh, that is not acceptable in the context of his personal conduct. Uh, that created a, an, a process of discourse that was, again, very polarizing and uh, different. Uh, Netanyahu fired uh, some of the people who would try to criticize him, blame the police, uh, blame the, the judicial system. That created some of the uh, epicenter of what later on in this government is now a part of the legal reform, which is another a factor that influences this the, this debate. Um, but uh, Netanyahu became so toxic. So the political system now began to divide, not just based on the ideological lines of right and left, but really along the, along the personal lines of those who accept Netanyahu and those who don't. Up to the point that uh, those who do not accept Netanyahu, uh, sit, some of them, his disciples, people who otherwise would think similarly to him when it comes to economic issues, when it comes to political issues, when it comes to Palestinian issues, sits to the left of him as opposition until he leaves. Um, and then they will say, okay, we are actually there. So the, the right, if you look at the right versus left, actually the center right uh, is actually much larger than the 64 against, uh, you know, 56, um, because of the Netanyahu factor, uh, it, it is divided in a different way. Um, but actually, the from all the factors I've mentioned before, uh, the shift to center-right was, was completed quite some time ago. And now the shift that enabled some of the people from uh, the camps, uh, which some would call radical right, occurred. Um, has to do with uh, partially with, with the Netanyahu factor and with the population that I've mentioned before, because this is very sectarian types of politics. And also with some, you know, in Israel, we have uh, sometimes tendencies to have, to give a chance for new parties. So um, when uh, Itamar Benkvir speaks about Jewish power and says, you know, we're going to stop the crime and you have a lot of people who, uh, suffer from uh, issues where the police is not strong enough, says, you know what, we'll just try to give him a chance. Are they, do they really buy everything he says? I'm not sure. But de facto, the, the coalition uh, government and the fact that there's so many people from the center who otherwise would agree to what Netanyahu stands for, but because they personally object to it, would not sign with him, he had to sign and create a coalition with the more... Uh, conservative, some would say radical parts um, of the uh, of the coalition, which created the most conservative right-wing government that we've had ever since 1948 when Israel was established. And this is uh, perhaps in a very short way an attempt to explain to you some of the dynamics that have led to the creation of this government, why some of the people uh, who, who are now uh, uh, in positions of power became really ministers. I'm not sure this is this reflects the view of the country. There's some, as I try to explain now, uh, specific political circumstances uh, that enable this to happen. Uh, in the last uh, four years, we have seen uh, more than once, more than twice, more than three times, uh, very rapid political shifts. I would not be surprised uh, if it's not going to be the, the last one we'll see. I don't think that uh, this particular mindset um, it is representative of the mood of the country. And actually, if you look at public polls, uh, it uh, became clear that the majority of the people are much more in the center stage and the person actually who received at least according to the polls, uh, the popularity is a very gray candidate, uh, former chief of staff by the name of Minister Benny Gantz, um, who has really tried to be a, a centrist, uh, compromise almost type of a candidate, not very dynamic, but is trying to do something uh, uh, which call which we call the uh, a word that is difficult to translate 
uh, what do you call it? kingship, kingsmanship, which is mainly kind of a broader thinking that looks at Israel as a whole rather than a sectarian piece. I'll say one more thing or a couple more points on the U.S. part because that was another part of the title. And then uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, actually hear you and, and hear any thoughts that any of you may have uh, on what I've said and generally on the issue uh, uh, you know, in mind. Um, and I will say uh, that, uh, of course, some of this created some tension between Israel and, Uni and the United States. Uh, United States is Israel's most uh, important and long-standing ally ever since uh, its establishment in 1948. The relationship with the United States are important, strategic, significant, um, and, and very close. And at times, uh, they uh, may face some difficulties, certainly at a time when uh, administration, the Biden administration, uh, democratically lean or, or liberal left lean administration tackles a government in Israel, which is very much to the right. Um, and then there are policies in, in where uh, the Americans and us do not see eye to eye. Um, there have been issues in the past regarding uh, the West Bank, regarding uh, 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 settlements, uh, uh, regarding uh, Temple Mount. There have been a number of uh, issues as such. The uh, administration, President Biden, has not yet invited Prime Minister Netanyahu for a visit, which is a departure from the usual protocol. Um, there are the issues uh, relating to uh, the Iran uh, strategy and where Netanyahu and President Biden do not see eye to eye. Uh, there are the attempts of uh, uh, pu further pushing on the Abraham Accords and normalization, uh, where uh, Israel needs a very active U.S. involvement. And it does not seem that the United States is uh, is uh, uh, happy to to accommodate uh, Israel in this particular time, um, and all of that uh, shows a, a degree of uh, difficulties in the relationship. You can add to that um, the fact that <clears throat> this particular government is very much at odds also with the American Jewish community. It is very organized, very vocal uh, overall. Uh, in terms of its positions is mostly leaning to the left, while the vast majority uh, uh, you know, of this government very much tilts to the right. And they appoint uh, ministers, a minister responsible for the diaspora that really does not speak the language uh, of the majority of the American Jewish community in particular. All of that very much adds to the tension. Um, so certainly uh, uh, there is a degree of tension but a degree of tension does not mean that the relationships uh, that the relationship are are uh, uh, very uh, that the relationships are are severed. Uh, there's still very tight uh, coordination on all levels. Uh, there is an understanding both in the U.S. as well as here uh, that this is part of the democratic cycle. Uh, governments come and go and change. The same applies for American administrations. Um, this particular administration and this particular government uh, are meant to, to collide uh, because of their uh, initial orientations. Uh, and the Americans see themselves as a moderating factor and um, uh, they uh, would not accept it and they would do so publicly as the ambassador said a number of times. And also the spokesperson of the State Department criticizing Israel um, and then again, the symbolic part of being not being uh, not bringing to the meeting uh, a presidential meeting with uh, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu. Um, and I'll end with uh, a word about the future and perhaps a word about optimism. Uh, if you look in statistically, uh, Israel had seen in the last uh, four years very significant changes uh, in its. Uh, uh, policy and politics, uh, Israel had uh, seen, uh, you know, fourth and fifth government, and Israel uh, had seen a very rapid process of change. It seemed that this government uh, is a bit more stable than the previous governments. They were able to pass a budget. Uh, it's clear that uh, although there's disagreement amongst members of the coalition on a good number of issues, uh, it's not going to be uh, within their interests to take this government apart so quickly. Um, 
And so there's a chance that it will survive. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to make it, of course, uh, but there's a chance that it uh, will survive at least uh, for, for a while. Uh, we'll continue with, with some policies uh, uh, that were continued detentions, both in Israel and outside Israel. This government faces probably the most active oppositions that it had seen, not just uh, in, inside the parliament, but really in a form of very active civic society that uh, now for really uh, now 23, 24 weeks coming out, hundreds of thousands of people every week to protest against government's policies to stop uh, particular moves like the legal, uh, uh, what we call here the legal revolution or the legal reform. Uh, and it's we actually have seen uh, very interestingly a very solid active civic society that is able to at least for now halt uh, some government legislation. Netanyahu is actually trying to balance this out. Uh, the common perception is that he does not share many of the views uh, of uh, his partners from the uh, Jewish Power um, uh, Party, uh, but he is stuck uh, because that's the only coalition he can work with. The others would not work with him. And he's trying to basically uh, keep uh, a degree of sanity uh, and and uh, and calm people down when he can um, in a limited way. I guess it could be worse, uh, but he's able to do something uh, and and re try to reassert his power uh, with the hope that he'll be able to stabilize it um, at least until the next uh, crisis. So in back inside Israel, uh, uh, you have issues coming up uh, really week by week. You have still significant protests. It's like a new routine. You know, we've had weeks where the main roads in Tel Aviv were blocked, uh, trains were stopped, uh, all because of protests. Um, at least I would say here, uh, people are able to do that. Uh, the media very much follows. Uh, people are not going to be just be arrested in a, in a random way uh, because they've been a part of a protest. I mean, that's part of the democracy that is still very much alive and kicking. And I think many people are very proud of, of that uh, process in particular because it shows a degree of maturity of civic society, but it also shows uh, some degree of concern uh, because the discourse is very polarizing. You have camps um, that's not only disagree with each other, but really disrespect each other. And the, the polarizing discourse is, is not good news, not for us and not in other places when uh, you see this process happen. There's a lot of work of reconciliation and, and bringing back the country together, finding a, a medium for, for, for a center discourse. And I very much hope that we'll be able to do it. Uh, uh, this will take some time. And I think under the current circumstances uh, uh, with uh, this government, uh, that's not going to happen so quickly. But government change here, as we've seen, and I assume that if we would take this conversation in one year from now, I will be able to tell you a bit of a different end, uh, even if now I won't be able to anticipate exactly what that is. So let's me uh, end here, done a bit more than half an hour, uh, and I'm happy to uh, open it up for any questions or comments on any of this or anything else. Thank you very much, Dr. Nierbombs. Uh It was uh, really good and stimulating and wrapping up uh, uh, historical uh, summary and uh, analyzing, explaining the uh, the 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 power points, uh, the power structure, the power uh, aspects, edges of your country. It was really good for our students, uh, especially uh, my students from the Department of English, uh, uh, because you know we also try to discuss some uh, power relations within the context of cultural studies course. Uh, I think, yeah, it was it was good and they got much, uh, you know, information thanks to your presentation. Uh, thanks a lot again. Uh, Professor uh, Yusuf Chinar, would you like to yes. begin with your yes. questions and commentary, of course? Please. Uh, first of all, uh, my dear friend Nirbons, uh, you explain every details relating to international relations of Israel and uh, especially uh, in turn uh, policy of uh, Israel 
will listen. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, especially, you know that uh, Israel political system uh, need a coalition. And this coalition system, uh, including a lot of uh, small parties. Uh, therefore, now uh, my question is uh, especially based on stability and uh, instability. If you look at European culture, especially uh, coalition system uh, providing too much stability for them. But if you look at Middle East countries, stability, what is stability? Especially a uh, long-term policy uh, or long-term uh, leadership, uh, especially Middle East strategic culture, sometimes uh, mention that uh, leadership also uh, instability too much big threat to democracy, according to Middle East uh, uh, culture, strategic culture. Uh, now, uh, Israel uh, coalition uh, has a, a lot of uh, far-right parties and their interest in Palestine question, especially against uh, Arab, especially they are uh, not want to participate uh, peace process, especially. Now, uh, my question, uh, Israel in the future with uh, the government, the Netanyahu government uh, can participate to the Palestine peace process. Uh, my first question. Second, uh, you know, uh, especially United States and Israel relation. If you look at uh, United States, uh, when withdraw from Middle East country, uh, Middle East. Oh, Especially, uh, uh, it grows, uh, now voices. <laughs> uh, sorry about it. Uh, especially the Middle East country, uh, when the uh, United States withdraw, uh, this gap not fill up other countries. Uh, now China especially wants to uh, make more part participation, especially you know uh, that Saudi Arabia and Iran peace process by conducting with uh, China. And uh, especially if you look at Netanyahu and Biden relations, uh, United States and Israel relations not going uh, well. And uh, according to you, uh, in the future, especially uh, United States and Israel relations, uh, if the Biden government change, uh, especially Trump again come to the power, can make more uh, participate to uh, Israel and United States relations or not? I want to learn this answer. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, all right, very good. I will try. You have touched on a number of issues here, uh, my dear Yusuf. So uh, let me start first of all with the just giving some numbers uh, to the parties. Um, look, we have 64 members of the coalition. Half of them, 32 are Likud. Uh, and the uh, there is really one party, Jewish power, uh, which is connected to uh, another block of party that received 14 seats. Uh, they're considered the, the more uh, radical right. Um, the religious Zionism and Jewish power, they ran as a bloc. Um, and this is really one party that is signifying this. And the rest of them are parties that are very familiar. They're more to the right, more to the left, but they have been there. Uh, so I want just to, again, give a perspective on the numbers. Um, the uh, opposition party, Likud had 32. The, the, the opposition leader, uh, Yair Lapid has 24 seats. Um, and, and so uh, it's not, uh, I would say, a knockout, as, uh, uh, you know, as you may see. It's, uh, uh, you know, a, a competition that goes by points. And at this point, uh, the, the right wing wins. Uh, but again, not in, a, uh, you know, not in a scenario that cannot be changed. Even politically, some members from the coalition would say, you know, enough. And some of them did not even vote with the coalition. Uh, so it's not 
that they can do whatever they want. And it's not that this can stay forever there. Again, I was trying to explain the, the factors that brought some of the situation in. And these factors can change. Um, I think if you would have had the elections today, you would already find, would have found different results. Um, when it comes to the Palestinians, uh, this has been one of the factors that actually had brought uh, to the rise of the uh, uh, more right-wing uh, government. I mean, broadly speaking, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is stuck for quite some time. Uh, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is stuck. Uh, we would, we're not going to analyze and open all of it. Um, but you have leadership on both sides that uh, uh, does not come to be in order to create uh, a, a, an arrangement. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, and uh, Mahmoud Abbas know each other for many years. Mahmoud Abbas has been there. They have not been elections in the PA since 2006. Um, and the PA uh, uh, is also divided between Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, there is very little cohesive leadership that can be found, and the Palestinians were, for the most part, refused to go back to the table uh, and and put something more concrete uh, to to negotiate. Netanyahu, on the other hand, had other more important issues, and if he is going to uh, start uh, dealing with the Palestinian file, which personally perhaps he would have, uh, he is more moderate than some of his other parts of the coalition. He that is not going to allow. Uh, significant concessions. This will help the debate uh, or the confrontation with the Americans and will also not help the uh, negotiations that would not exist with the Palestinians. And that goes back to the uh, point of your uh, regarding the American administrations. Can there be a, a, a more comfortable American administration uh, if there is a Republican administration would it be more comfortable for Benjamin Netanyahu and this particular government? The answer is probably, broadly, yes. Um, they would be more accommodating and have less uh, uh, friction with the uh, Israelis. But, you know, that's uh, not the situation uh, at the moment. Uh, and uh, I think Netanyahu may be happy to wait or just survive uh, because the, the situation here is so volatile uh, and that, that keeps him uh, very, very busy. But naturally, again, this particular configuration makes uh, the debate in Israel volatile and the debate between Israel and the U.S. also volatile. Maybe uh, I want to uh, ask a small question. Uh, Labour Party, uh, by, the, by uh, losing uh, power, in my opinion, uh, since 1917, uh, now, uh, what is the main reason the Labour Party wh why uh, losing power? Especially, uh, yes, maybe Cold War reasons uh, we can add. Uh, also, other uh, international reasons maybe we can put on the desk. But uh, local reasons, uh, if you uh, explain this, uh, I will be very happy. So this is... a. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I, I chose to, to start my, my review, looking a little bit of history and, and note the fact that Israel started uh, really as a socialist country and socialist politics led by labor government. Um, and I mentioned that the uh, labor government was part of parcel of that camp. It controlled that camp. It had to do with the trade unions. It has to do with the worker unions. It has to do uh, uh, with the organized labor. It has to do with the institutions, with the newspapers, uh, with the kibbutzim, all of that. With time, some of that became less relevant. And also the labor government has been the leader uh, of the engagement with the Palestinians uh, and, and they brought the Oslo process. Um, the Oslo process had perceived, broadly speaking, as a failure in uh, Israeli circles. Um, the uh, Oslo process brought uh, uh, really additional friction and eventually it failed and, and uh, we did not see progress. We've seen the split between the PA and, and the Hamas, uh, you know, a decade, almost a decade and a half uh, later. Uh, we have seen uh, really a process that rather than bringing the two people together, created more 
uh, uh, friction, created more checkpoints, created more fences, because we've seen radicalization and terrorism uh, and everything that is uh, not a peace process. Um, and since labor have been uh, uh, associated with that process, uh, it began to lose steam. And then, you know, the leaders, the leaders of labor, you know, the legendary leaders, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, you know, Shimon Peres, who became president, Yitzhak Rabin, of course, was assassinated um, by being the leader, uh, by being the prime minister and, and the leader, um, uh, really, of, of the labor uh, party and the labor movement. Uh, the leaderships that came later, I would say, was not... Uh, Broadly, or we're not considered so centrist or, or, or consensus building, with the exception of actually uh, president today, President Herzog, who used to be the leader of labor and was able to bring labor in one election in a very significant result. Um, Meirab Michaeli, the current leader, uh, a women's activist, uh, very controversial, uh, uh, visible figure. Uh, she's very visible, people know her. Um, she likes to upset people in many ways with, with, with some of her views. So she took labor a bit more into the corner, I would say. And in some ways, you know, what is the agenda of labor represent today? If it's the economic agenda, well, people have lost steam when it comes to more socialist policies. If it's on a political agenda on the Palestinians, uh, there's not vision or partners or anything that, you know, can be you know put on there. Um, if it's about charisma and leadership, there was not much uh, that was offered. Um, and therefore, it um, navigated itself into being kind of a very niche uh, a party that has kind of lost its relevancy. And it only received four uh, votes, barely passing the threshold in the last election. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chinar and for very another informative answer and short presentation near bombs dr near bombs uh do you have any other questions dear participants your guests uh kubra one of my third year students kubra suner she asks from the chat box Thank you for your presentation. I am wondering how long Mr. Netanyahu can be prime minister because according to the Turkish constitution, the prime minister can only be elected president for two times. Uh, I wondered about Israel constitution and I wish peace in Israel and all other countries who are waiting for good days that they deserve. First of all, uh... Uh, Kubra, thank you very much for the uh, for the blessings. I, I joined them. Uh, we need that. And uh, it's going to be up to many of you to bring the next generation uh, into better times. And remember that we should not uh, waver from this very important task. Uh, Israel actually does not have a constitution. Uh, Israel has a different system of uh, basic laws. This has actually now been a part of the debate regarding the legal reform issues. Uh, but it also means that there are some issues that were not concluded. So there are some laws that uh, codify uh, some elements, uh, uh, some basically basic uh, freedoms um, and labor laws. Uh, but in, in terms of the political uh, limitations, statute limitation, uh, the prime minister uh, can continue to uh, run for office if he's elected by the party. Um, more than two terms, it can also be a, it can also be a president that um, has not been the case uh, usually that prime ministers uh, went to be presidents. I know it's a bit more common in Turkey, um, but Netanyahu uh, is able to continue to lead its party even if it's more than two terms. There's no statute limitation uh, for his ability to run. His party needs to nominate him, and then he can then he can run. The president is being elected by the members of Knesset, so it, in theory, he can also be nominated to become a president. The president in Israel uh, is more similar to the Queen uh, of England, uh, so not a lot. Uh, uh, it's very symbolic, not uh, very operational. 
Um, so the the influence of the president on policy is more is mostly symbolic, um, rather than uh, executive. Thank you very much. Uh, another question, or else I would like to. Uh, dear Amra, can I ask a question to dear? Yeah, uh, lecturer Don Demirel uh, from the Office of International Relations. Please, uh, Mr. Demirel, go ahead and ask your questions, please. Uh, hi, dear uh, Nir Bombs. I am lecturer at Batman University. Uh, I thank. I would like to thank you for your uh, valuable attendance. Uh, unfortunately, radical right is growing up in all all around the world. It's a very sad situation for me, especially because as a person that give importance to freedoms, it makes me very unhappy die by die. So, uh, but even if I am, uh, I was majored in international relations, uh, I didn't give uh, so much importance to relations between states. Uh, I have wanted to uh, learn the uh, wonder of public uh, until now, but uh, from now on, uh, how can I say? Until now, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to learn uh, what is response of uh, Israeli public to radical right. Uh, is is there a greater response? Uh, and uh, if it is. Um, supported by public if a uh, uh, current government give importance to give importance to radical right uh, i mean is there a great uh, is there a powerful uh, acceptance by uh, uh, israel public to radical right thank you very much well i, I wonder if i could try and uh, and do a uh, in a second, a screen share and perhaps show you some pictures of uh, what it all means. Uh, let me see if I'm able to do it, and uh, because I think it's an interesting thing, and I'm not sure if you have, um, if if you have seen this. I'm just doing this live with you. Um, uh, I'm showing you pictures from the protests uh, in uh, that we have seen in Israel. Um, in the uh, in the last uh, really now I would say a few years, um, and and there are many uh, uh, such pictures. Um, uh, we actually see every day almost, uh, and 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 every week on a Saturday night, uh, and you know I can take this. You know you can see uh, you know some of these uh, pictures. Uh, this is from Tel Aviv, really. Uh, um, you know, sometimes on the main highway, which is literally being blocked uh, every week by hundreds of thousands of uh, protesters. Um, I'll, uh, uh, I'll find you one uh, from from Jerusalem next to the uh, next to the government, uh, and you see here is okay. I think this is similar to the one I think I've had before. Um, uh, you see this one, uh, which is uh, uh, corrupt and prime minister. Uh, uh, you know, we want to we want democracy. Uh, um, there is a uh, here. You'll see though, know, save democracy. This is in front of the uh, the Knesset. Save democracy. Uh, 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 the, that this has been a very a big part of uh, of all of this protest. So, uh, Dogan, the civic society has been really, really active and really, really involved. Uh, we've seen many also other responses, including uh, when there were times, uh, you know, price tag acts from one camp, let's say against the Palestinians, you have others coming and saying, no, we are with you, we are supporting you. Uh, civic society have stepped uh, and not just against radical rights, really against the government, showing that uh, it cannot uh, uh, really move policy the way it wants to 
um, uh, and there are first debates on this, uh, and they uh, they were able to even force a, a mechanism of compromise that is now being managed by the president that also stepped in. Um, and so I would say that so far the Israeli civic society had really passed the exam. Uh, it has been uh, really active and it was able to stop uh, at least some of the uh, measures of this uh, of this government or the more uh, radical elements or uh, extreme elements in it. And I would say that some of it was not completely uncomfortable to the prime minister, because as I said, the prime minister is considered a much more centrist figure. And he was just now stuck with the coalition of people more from the right, and he have to find a way to uh, to hold them together so he won't lose the broader file of the government at large. Thank you very much, dear Nir Bones. Uh, as you know, uh, the power of civil society is very important, important for a great democracy, as you know. Uh, to be honest, I have not uh, so informed about uh, civil society of Israel. Uh, unfortunately, in Turkey, uh, civil society is uh, so weak. Uh, everything is up to uh, state. And uh, because of this uh, sad situation, we cannot reach a, a powerful uh, democratic level. Uh, thanks to your uh, presentation, <laughs> I got a, a very valuable information about uh, a civil society of Israel. Thank you very much. I hope a great uh, evening for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Demirel. Uh, in fact, I was about to ask you a question in relation to uh, civil society, but you 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 nearly answered my question uh, because I was about to ask or you know ask. Uh, uh, about the the real power of civil society in order to to uh, represent the opposing part, opposing view of the Israel Israeli society, but you nearly uh, you know you 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 gave a, a satisfactory answer. But I uh, I have another short question to finish to complete the session uh, in order not to shift or transform uh, this. Uh, talk into a tiring level because you seem so tired. Sorry uh, for that. I'm just uh, wondering about the proportional uh, participation in the elections in Israel because you know uh, we have recently uh, you know a few days ago we we have just completed the the second round of president pre president pre presidential election uh, stage and. Uh, uh, you know, even if some uh, unequal uh, opportunities for both sides, not for both sides, but for the the other side of the uh, the other side representing the uh, opposition, uh, it was around uh, the the part participation uh, ratio pro proportion was around eighty five or eighty six uh, percent. But I, I'm just wondering about the the same circumstance in Israel. Uh, is there an ist insistent, uh, ongoing, or uh, determined uh, uh, opposition uh, coalition or you know power in in Israel uh, democracy or uh, political stage? So the uh, uh, elections. The, the the broader percentages of the uh, participations are about close to 70 percent um the I'm trying to now remember uh the actual percentage of what happened in the last uh, election it wasn't a significant shift we've had four election systems and and people became uh, somewhat tired. Uh, you know, and when they reached uh, the the last one, um, and so it was a uh, um, a, a little lower. I think it was uh, in the high sixties, but I you have to excuse me. I don't remember this by heart. Um, uh, I think that uh, in in uh, twenty twenty, you know, in in the last elections we had last November. Uh, it reached uh, 
close to 70%. Um, and that was not very different. It, it In the 70s, uh, we've had like, you know, close to 80%. Um, and in the beginning of 2000s, it just began to go down and it fluctuated between the uh, 60s and 70s uh, and kind of around 70%. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, uh, the Arabs who have uh, some elections voted less. Um, um, but it has not changed a significant way. Um, 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 so it's not the best, but it's not the worst. Uh, and uh, I think that actually the next election will see even higher because you've seen the energy of civic society that is uh, continuing to go uh, uh, very up, you know, significantly. And I, so I assume that this number would go uh, up. Um, and, and here there is uh, not, not, not much more to add. There's no like a specific drama or number that is a change in the last few years. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really uh, happy, uh, you know, for uh, witnessing or monitoring uh, the protesters, uh, especially in favor of secularism or liberal uh, freedom of speech or freedom of expression in, especially for those living in uh, Tel Aviv, you know, uh, as far as I remember, uh, a month or a few months ago, uh, there was a sequence of protestings uh, in the streets of uh, Tel Aviv, you know, in in favor of uh, for the way of freedom of expression uh, against the constitutional intervention of the prime minister of Israel. So uh, I'm greeting all those people, uh, you know, uh, fighting for uh, liberal uh, thoughts and freedom of expression. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's said uh, that the, we've seen these protests uh, now in the 23rd week in a row uh, in a very significant way, man, mostly every Saturday night in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, but actually in many other cities as well. Um, but I will just correct you by saying this is not just about freedom of speech, although you can say secularization is a part of it. Um, it these are really political protests against the agenda of this government. It was prompted because of the legal agenda. Uh, but uh, they, they are really related to uh, much broader agendas at this point. Uh, and they became part of the picture of, of the government and the political cycle here. Uh, really, every every week uh, you, you will see them um, and literally with hundreds of thousands of people participating. Yeah, thank you very much. And we have one last question among the students. Uh, our student from uh, the Faculty of Administrative Sciences, Mohamed Numan. Uh, Numan, would you like to ask your question, please? Hello, Mr. Bombs. hope you're doing good. So uh, I have basically two questions. I want to know your point of view on this. So number one is that you said that in Israel, you guys uh, make a coalition government because one party is not getting enough uh, seats. So you make coalition government. And uh, when the coalition governments are made, uh, they uh, they don't make a long term policy. And then you gave uh, when we were talking, you mentioned about the the rule of a guy uh, in Turkey, and he has been ruling from past uh, twenty years. So don't you think that uh, a person who has been ruling for a long period of time can make uh, a long term policy for the country, which can be beneficial? And when we are uh, uh, comparing this thing with the coalition government, when the parties are going in elections, again, they have a argument that because I was in coalition with Mr. B, he did not let me, the, let me do, do the work which I was thinking. So I want to know your point of view and what is the solution for this uh, coalition government? Because uh, they cannot make a long-term policy. And, you know, this has been happening in my country uh, from, for a very long period of time. Thank you so much, uh, Muhammad. You, you ask a very uh, apt and 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 uh, an important uh, question, uh, and I would say that you're correct. Uh, at this point, we actually see the deficiency of the coalition uh, system. Uh, we have actually tried in a number of ways to change the election law 
So uh, the threshold was uh, now uh, uh, in street 0.25%. It used to be lower, supposed to decrease the number of parties. Um, there were different attempts to create uh, direct election for prime minister and uh, elections separately for the parliament. Now, which is in one file, it didn't really help much. Uh, there were ideas about uh, separating into uh, regional accountability. So you have uh, uh, regional counties type of elections for some of the parliament, which we may help. But overall, when the country is split, it's very difficult to find a, a, a system that will, you know, you need the, the, you need the smaller parties to basically sign uh, on a law that will take them off out of power. So in order for doing this, you really need the big political crisis to uh, be solved. And then the two b largest parties saying, OK, we're going to together form an election law that will basically almost annihilate the smaller parties. This is not an easy thing to do because, of course, they would resist and, and they, they, the larger parties are not strong enough to do this. So you are we're kind of stuck with that system a little bit. Uh, it's not an ideal system. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how to change it because, again, in order to change it, you need the support of those parties whose uh, change basically will take some of their power. So they're not very eager to do it. And that's partly why you have this system, which is not perfect, that is continuing to uh, be operated. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, this has been happening in my country as well. And we have, we have been facing the same problem. You know, the main problem, I think, is the long-term policy. When a country is not having a long-term policy, the governments are coming and going, and the development is very slow. By the way, thank you so much uh, for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Numan. Uh, Mahabat, you asked for... Your turn to to ask your question. Are you okay. still there? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mahabat uh, is our, our outgoing Erasmus student representing our university in Poland. Mahabat, the stage is yours. Please ask your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say my thanks for this uh, beneficial lecture. And my question is short. Um, it's about, do you think globalization is a factor that uh, raised the um, radical right for each country? Because uh, I think the global economy simply means uh, switch shops in poor countries. I mean, uh, um, globalization benefits uh, the rich nations who control prices, who influence the economies of poor countries. And uh, what's more, I can say, globalization is only good for those uh, who are already economically strong. Uh, like it is the big multinational companies who really benefit and actually it worries me that sometimes uh, they seem to have more power and influence over our lives than elected governments uh, because uh, some of them are actually richer than whole countries which must be a bad thing so uh, I want to ask you do you think the globalization is a factor that we can say it is about the rise of radical right for uh, rich countries? Well, I will try to give an answer to this. And, and I would say that uh, I only accept this uh, thesis that you have suggested uh, in, in part. Look, globalization certainly has some negative effects, but it also has some positive ones. Um, it enables countries to have access to knowledge, to uh, technology, uh, to... Uh, uh, means that can enable them to uh, uh, perhaps turn themselves uh, from uh, uh, a weak country into a stronger one. Of course, it gives some advantage for the larger players who already control some of the markets, but it also gives an opportunity for the smaller players in, to improve their position. Of course, they need to do it correctly, um, and they need to uh, uh, use uh, globalization uh, to close social gaps, to invest in education, to bring the knowledge to the people, to uh, uh, build systems that will enable these new opportunities uh, that the globalized economy and the world offers so people, and young people in particular, could use them. That is not dependent uh, so much just on the global powers. It depends on the politics of each country and, and the conduct of ministries of uh, industry, of uh, uh, 
commerce, uh, the way the government really function. And I think some who know how to use it will benefit from it. And those who do not how to use it will not benefit from it. I also uh, uh, think that, uh, at least in the Israeli case, a lot of this really became an internal domestic issue, not so much um, an international one. So a lot of the debates and the political debates were less to do with the global powers that want to do with the, the, the people who were part and parcel of uh, the Israeli uh, system here. Um, and therefore, uh, again, globalization did not play a major role here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mahabat. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bones. Uh, if you don't have, a, have any other questions, dear participants, I would like to uh, give the turn, uh, Professor Yusuf Chinar, to, to give an end to this session and uh, the series, the series of Erasmus Talks. Uh, First of all, uh, very important issues we talk, and I want to share a very short uh, anecdote. One day, uh, Einstein going to India and uh, by the plane and sitting and uh, next uh, a Indian man sitting uh, uh, the plane and very long journey from United States to India. Mm -hmm. And uh, Einstein uh, saying that uh, this journey very long, so uh, we can ask question each other. Uh, if you answer the question, uh, if you don't answer the question, uh, I will pay $500. Uh, dollars. If you, uh, if I ask uh, Indian and not uh, answer the question, you are paying five dollars. Uh, and first question coming to uh, uh, from uh, Einstein, very famous scientist, uh, asking question: uh, the moon, how many miles from uh, the Earth? Uh, far uh, asking, and uh, Indian man only listening, not answering the question. Uh, in the man uh, saying that five uh, dollars uh, you are, and after then Indian people, uh, Indian man asking question, uh, what is the, uh, what is uh, coming up the hill with three legs, go down with four legs, Einstein thinking very important scientist, uh, answering every question not answering. And Einstein paying to Indian man five hundred dollars, and after then turn to uh, Einstein asking same question to Indian man, uh, what uh, is the uh, coming up with three legs, the hill uh, coming down with four legs, Indian man thinking not answering the question. Yes, today we are talking Middle East questions. Middle East problems, very serious topics. So some questions not answering in the Middle East uh, like this. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, participations. Uh, and also we have a lot of students, academics, and every week uh, we uh, organize and talking about international relations and other arts and designs we talk and today, this night uh, especially uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bombs, my very old friend. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I am very glad to listen to you and especially I would like to thank Emra again and all participants. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, inshallah, uh, next term we will organize again and uh, very different topics we will uh, talk about uh, them. Uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Imra and Yusuf. Uh, and I hope it was useful and I hope that uh, you have uh, gained something from this. And I also want to join, uh, uh, I think it was Bursar said before, uh, that uh, you would not lose the hope for taking leadership roles in trying to uh, use politics to bring this world into a better place. 
we need to do that each where we are. And this is a joint mission, I hope, for all of us. Yes. As Ernest Hemingway, uh, you know, uh, quoted on the title of his very celebrated novel, The Sun Also Rises. So as much as the sun rises, there will be hope for all humanity. So we'll, we will keep going on that way. And the journey will carry on in that way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.